have your Bibles, I'd love to invite you to Colossians chapter 3. That's where we'll be for the morning. i got to tell you, it's a joy to be here. Jesse and I are given a lot of opportunities to travel and be in a lot of churches. And uh, we felt so welcome this morning and got a chance to meet uh, most of you. And uh, it's just, it really is, it's a joy to be here. I, I really enjoyed Sunday school, uh, hearing some testimonies and just your heart for the Lord is so encouraging. But uh, if you'll open Colossians chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 1. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. So at the very beginning, we see this is the letter of Paul to the church at Colossae. And he tells us, as his audience, he said, if, if you as the people who have died to sin, you've been raised with Christ, so the people who have experienced God's salvation, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for just the, the several testimonies in this room of how You have changed lives how you have slain our sin, that you were the one that went to the cross and endured it for, for us. Father, we cannot begin to fathom your grace that you being divine, you being the Son of God, would take our place, would take the punishment that was meant for us because you love us. Father, I pray now that, that your Holy Spirit would come that your Holy Spirit would teach us, teach us, convict us of sin, and set us free, Lord. Show us that, that we're not meant to walk in shame, that we're not meant to walk in, in bondage, God, that you've already paid the price for that. So, Lord, I ask if there be any in here who are struggling with their sin, who are struggling with the old man, God, that you would set them free. And that you would remind them of who they are as a beloved son, as a beloved daughter in you. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we see immediately that, that Paul tells us, okay, if you've experienced this grace, if you've experienced this goodness, he says, set your mind on things above. Seek heavenly things. And he says, because you've died. I love, I love that phrase. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So what, what does that mean, you've died? Well, for any of us who claim to be a child of the Most High God, then that means we have come to a point where we have had to allow Christ to put our sin to death. Okay, one of the things that, that we're struggling with a lot in a lot of evangelical churches, and even some Baptist churches, is this what we've kind of coined as easy believism. Which is just basically me being able to say, okay, you're convicted of sin, you, you want to be saved, I'm just going to say a prayer, you repeat that prayer after me, and if you've said it, you're good with God. You're saved. There's no, that's it. But if we look at Romans 10, 9, and 10, it tells us that we are to repent, we are to turn away from our sin, we are to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but there's another proponent that is very commonly missed. He says you have to confess Him as Lord of your life. <clears throat> Jesus has to become Lord of my life. What does that mean? That means master. That means overseer. Well, well what, how, how do we do that? That means that I can't walk as I used to walk. I can't be the same guy that I used to be. It means that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I am a new creation. I've been bought with a price. A very, very steep price. Uh, I want you to imagine, because most of you have, have bought homes or you've purchased a vehicle or had, a, had debt at some point and maybe you're still there. But I want you to imagine this. You rack up 
so much debt that you cannot possibly pay it back. Cannot, cannot, you look ahead, there, there's just no way that you're ever going to be able to pay this amount of debt back. And I want you to imagine that somebody from the bank comes to you and says, here's the deed. Here's the title. Your debt's been paid in full. What, what would that be like? I mean, I know some of us would be just jumping and shouting and screaming hallelujah. I know I, know I would. But that's the same thing that's happened to you in Christ. You had a debt. You had a sin debt that you couldn't pay. We had a sin debt that we couldn't pay. That we're not, on our best day, we're not good enough to earn. And Christ said, here it is. Paid in full. But you know, the sad thing is, even though a steep price has been paid, so, so many times we try to put the old man back on, right? We want to go back. And it just seems like this thing just draws us. So let's, that's what Colossians chapter 3 is about. It's one of my absolute favorite pieces of Scripture. Because you have that past tense. If you've been raised with Christ, if you've experienced that, that death to self and you put on Christ, then you need to seek the things that are above. You need to set your mind on things that are above. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And I love the words in verse 4. It says, when Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with Him in glory. So this is future tense. Okay? This is who you were. This is what we need to be doing. But this is the promise. He's coming back. And when He does, you're going to be with Him in glory. We talked in Sunday school about <clears throat> death. I mean, essentially. And, and what does it mean to have Christ and not have Christ going into our final moments of life? The difference is hope. We talked about hope. How now, for the rest of my life, no matter what happens to me, I know where I'm going. Amen. I know the life I have waiting for me. And this life is just going to be a vapor. <clears throat> but for eternity, I get to be with my King. Amen. And I get to be in the, the fellowship of all those who love Jesus. That's the promise. But then we move to verse 5, and, it's, and we get to the puts. <laughs> it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, Okay, so you have to continue this process. We call this sanctification. Okay, so put to death your members which are on the earth. It says fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, now if you'll look, I mean fornication is pretty cut and dry. Uncleanness. The word passion there, because I remember the first time I, I came across this, and I was like, I thought passion was a good thing. Okay. This word passion is actually the same word that's used in Romans 1.26 talking about how man left the natural affection for a man and the woman left the natural affection for a man for another woman. Okay, it talks about this burning evil passion towards something that's unclean. So just throw that out there. And then evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And it says because... Of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And you know, we talked about the cross in Sunday school and how God's wrath had to be satisfied. Okay, because if you think about it, if God is just, if God is a righteous God, He's a just God, then that means He must punish sin, right? I think we all would be in agreement with that. Okay, if He's a good God. He must do that. Okay, so Christ takes on the sins of the world. Okay, He drinks that cup and He slams it down and says, It is finished. It is done. You know, into your hands I commit my spirit. Okay, the debt's been paid. Okay, so God's wrath was satisfied in that moment of the cross. So that means that if you've been raised with Christ and you're in Christ, and your debt's been paid, that means God's wrath's not for you. Amen? Okay? But so many times, even though God's wrath is, is towards sin, and towards those who are in sin and aren't going to believe, why so many times do we try to step in that line of fire? God's wrath is not towards you, believer. 
It's intended for sin. But so many times we step in the way. We go back to that old man. And he says, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Put off anger. Put off wrath. Put off malice. Put off blasphemy. Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. You know, I, it's amazing how we continually grow. I know that for me, and I'm just going to be very real, very honest with you, this has probably been one of the hardest years I've ever experienced. I, uh, God has, has been so, so good to, to me and so good to us as a married couple. Uh, the last time I came here, I don't think we had actually planned a city church yet. I, we're part of a church plant in Conway. And uh, when we planted, we had 20, 30 college students, a couple of young families, and an older couple. And uh, I think we're in our 18th month now. And we have about 250 on a regular Sunday. And it's just, we never in our wildest dreams thought that God would bless us so quickly and so richly. But even in the midst of that, I realized that I had carried a lot of bitterness in my heart for a really long time. I had a I had an abusive father, uh, both physically and emotionally, and I carried that for 20 years, and I never knew how to deal with it. I never knew how to get rid of it, and then I married the most amazing person that I've ever met, who is my best friend, and she is my soulmate, and she's she's everything to me. But even in the midst of that, I found myself that bitterness coming out. And so, uh, I guess it's been 10 months now, Jesse and I came to this point where we realized we need, we need some help. I need some help. And through that journey, we have a marriage that is just amazing. We have a relationship with the Lord like we've never had before. And I finally experienced what true freedom in Christ is. To be set free from the bondage of that. And I know that so many of us, we cling to that. Because sometimes it's our defense mechanism. You know, we, we put up those high outer walls. We don't want you to really get into the heart of who we are. And sometimes we even try to fool ourselves to, to, to think that, that God can't see it because we don't want Him to see who we really are. But the reality is, is He's a good, good Father. He's a Father that loves you, that isn't going to condemn you, but wants to see you set free. Wants to see you walk in joy. Walk in peace. Walk in hope. But we have to put these things off. We can't, we can't put on that old man. So if, if we had, a, let's say we had a beggar come in here. A man that's homeless, has nothing. And we, we feed him. We put on new clothes for him. Find him a job so that he can work. How ridiculous would it be if he gave all it up just to put the old clothes back on and, and, and go out there and start being homeless again? It wouldn't make sense. But yet again, we do that so many times. We want to put those old rags back on. And he says, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So basically what that means is there's no distinction. The cross is for all. Okay, It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Hispanic. It doesn't matter. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ. You're in Him, and He is in all that I believed. It says, Now, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. So we were told previously to put off these things. Okay, This is not how we're to walk. And now He's telling us this is what it should look like. Put on tender mercies. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, 
so you also must do. There's a couple that introduced me to a concept called grace and release. Okay, say that with me. Grace and release. Okay, and what they mean by that is anytime they have an argument, anytime there's a disagreement, anytime that they have something in their heart that, that needs forgiveness, they say grace. And immediately, this is what they mean by that. Christ forgave you. Okay, that, that big debt that I talked about that's been paid in full, you've been forgiven a lot. Your sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Okay, so this petty deal that you have with somebody else, that's nothing. Okay, because you've been forgiven much, you need to forgive even if it's little. Okay, so they say grace and release. Let it go. Uh, probably the best advice I ever got uh, early on in marriage was, is this a hill you want to die on, son? Okay, if it's, if it's not a big deal, let it go. It's not worth it. If you won't remember it in a couple of years, because I was one that I tend to be a little more high strung. And Jesse's a little more laid back and, and kind of go with the flow and even kill. Uh, I'm learning that. <laughs> So it tells us to forgive and let the peace of God, that peace we talked about earlier, brother, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and to be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. Have you declared war on your sin? Have you declared war? Because whether you know it or not, you are in a war. You're in the midst of chaos. I mean, so many people brought up just kind of where our world is. And it's unfortunate. But the war is here. So have you declared war on your sin? And then for a lot of us, some of the things that talked about... Whatever you run to when you're hurting, when you're scared, where you spend your money, where you spend your time, that's your God. Okay, when, when no one else is around, the things that you do, that's who you are. And a lot of us, we all have maybe one or two sins that we're just prone to. It's one thing that we just really have to battle. Call those specific sins. But a lot of times we kind of try to domesticate it. Because we, at times, thought, well, I just can't beat this. I just can't, can't get rid of this. So we try to manage it. You know, okay, I, I'll try not to do this. I know I'm going to. We'll try to fence it in and, and domesticate it and try to keep it at bay, but that's the best we're going to be able to do. Kill it. If you try to manage it, you'll never beat it. you got to kill it. You've got to let Christ come in and do what only He can and put that to death. So we must declare war on our sins. Second, where do you run? When you stumble, when you fall, where do you run? Because a lot of us, myself included, when we fall, when we fall short, we think, now God's done with me. Now God's done with me. Or God's upset with me. The only time God's going to be happy with me is if I'm praying, if I'm reading my Bible, if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Then God loves me. He's okay with me. And that's, that's false. Worship is even in the midst of the stumble, even in the midst of the fall, you keep going after Christ. You keep going. Because you were never intended to just stumble and fall and Christ leave you. I love the story of Peter when he begins to walk on water with Jesus. It says that the waves begin to crash, life happened, and he got distracted, as most of us would, and he began to sink. And I love the wordage. He actually says, Save me, Lord, save me. And it says, Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and saved him. Christ will not leave you where you are. He loves you too much and He's paid too much of a price to leave you where you are. So let me put this before you. 
I don't know where you are. I don't know what you struggle with. But I do know that you struggle. And I do know that you have sin that you battle just like I do. But I want to tell you something. Shame and guilt are not from God. Shame and guilt are not from God. He convicts us, but He doesn't shame us. He's a good Father that loves you, that wants a relationship with you. You weren't intended to step in the way of wrath. You weren't intended to go back to the old man. You're a new creation in Christ. Walk <coughs> worthy. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, do to the glory of the Lord. And that's the word of Colossians chapter 3 to us this morning. So, I'm going to pray and I just ask you to, to bow your heads right now. I'll have the song leader come down. So now it's a lot of... Colossians 3 just covers so many things from forgiveness to the old man to the new man. So there's a lot there. But I would just encourage you, grace is such a beautiful thing. I, I, I was moved in Sunday school just hearing the words of people talk about grace and how I'm so unworthy. But yet still Christ loves me and loved me enough to pay my price, to pay my debt. That's amazing. It's unfathomable. We can't wrap our minds around it. If you've never experienced that, I would love to talk with you. If you're if you're in the midst of that struggle with that specific sin, or you've got some 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 junk in your life that you just need some prayer about, I'd love to pray with you. But I would just encourage you, whatever that be for you, don't leave here without making it right with the Lord. Because you are a new creation in Christ. And that is the life that He wants for you. Let's sing. Number 123. <laughs>